Hey guys, Jeremy here, uh, doing a spoiler-filled review of The Last Jedi. So, be warned, you saw the title, and I'm saying it now, I am going to basically reveal the entire movie here, and just talk about, more elaborately, my pros with the movie, my several cons with the movie, and just the overall feeling of bafflement. <laughs> That I had after this movie ended. So the film begins with a title scroll that's straight out of Empire Strikes Back a little bit, um, kind of very similar. And what we have is instead of the beginning of the Empire Strikes Back, what we get is actually the beginning of Rogue Squadron 3 uh, when they're evacuating Yavin because <laughs> the, the, the whole thing takes place in space. Um, the rebels are, uh, are, the resistance are leaving their planet because the empire the first order i'm gonna make that comparison a lot um they find them at their planet and this is super big destroyer ship this big bloody ship is super huge and it's like it's imposing it really reminded me a lot of the planet killer ships that were in the empires uh the the dark empire comics anyways all of a sudden, Poe comes out of nowhere and blasts all the guns on top of the ship, which admittedly was actually kind of cool, but at the same time, it's like, holy shit, one guy just destroyed the uh, entire defense of this ship. This guy clearly bought all of the microtransaction loot boxes, and that's not, there's going to be a lot of Battlefront 2 EA dickhead loot box jokes in this. So... They then do this bomber run. A lot of rebels get fucked up. Admittedly, I actually thought that was kind of cool. The entire run is a suicide mission. They blow up the ship, and that's it, though. So they then start running. It turns out that the Empire has an ability, though, to track you in hyperspace. The only thing is, it doesn't really make any fucking sense as to... It's just a thing that's created. And this was never something that happened previous. Like, how come it took them this long to find the Resistance? Why did they never find the resistance before while they were making this giant star killer base like the, a fucking gun the size of a planet i i don't know i i thought this was it was at this point when they said that we're being tracked in hyperspace and it wasn't like a traitor i totally thought there was a traitor mentality and that's what was coming that's what happens later on with laura dern's character there's this whole idea that there's a traitor and it's not. It's just a device that can track them. So that was the first time that I was like, huh. All the while, Luke and Rey are on his island. Luke is extremely grumpy. He is completely broken. And what we slowly start to get find out is the truth behind his relationship with Kylo Ren. Because all the while, Rey is trying to convince Luke to come back to the Force and come back to the Resistance, whereas Luke has totally shut himself off from the Force. Kylo and Rey are having this communication. They're able to sort of see each other through the Force. And it's actually really... That is one of the best parts of the movie, is this connection. The, the connection between Rey and Ren is the best part of the film. Their entanglement. They're kind of working together to take on their own issues. As well as who will break who. Who will turn who to what side. As... Ray grows strong as Ren grows stronger, so does Ray. That is kind of in turn with how they explain that in a sense of how Ray has been so powerful since Force Awakens is that she and Ren are connected in terms of their power. As powerful as he is in the dark side, she is just as powerful in the light side. I'm still kind of iffy on how that works, but either way. So then while that's going on. We go back, and the Resistance is running from the Empire. They're basically in a full-out run. There's this explosion that happens, and Leia gets sucked out into space, and then she fucking supermans back into the ship. I don't know. Some people were like, you know what? She, she's Force-sensitive. Okay. But like, fucking what? There's a difference between being Force-sensitive, having a slight ability to use the Force, and then full-on fucking supermaning, surviving in space. I... I don't know. I thought that part was a little bit ridiculous. 
Now I know it's Star Wars and everything, but I just, it, this was the part that I just raised my eyebrows like through my fucking forehead because I just thought that this was just so tacky, so ridiculous. Honestly, I thought she was going to die, but admittedly, this is the thing that Reen Johnson does throughout this movie is he takes avenues that you wouldn't expect. He takes them both good and bad. Um, and he takes a lot of risks, which admittedly, this is probably the most out there, most risky endeavor of a Star Wars film. And you'll find that out later as I go through. So Leia survives, but she's in a coma. So Laura Dern from Jurassic Park, it takes control, and her character's fucking useless. Her character is one of the first big problems with the movie. She, for some unknown reason has a plan of that what they're going to do is they're going to run to this planet, this former rebel base, and what they're doing is they can't hyperspace, obviously, because they'll just find them again, right? Which, thinking about it, though, considering they're going at it for a few hours, I don't know why they just didn't do a hyperspace jump to the planet itself with everyone in tow, because they just unnecessarily drag out the Empire to this planet for no reason. I, I don't... I don't know. I thought it was a little... Anyways. But, so, yeah. So, that's the plan. Get to this I, this salt... Ice slash salt planet. And make a defense there. Why doesn't she tell anyone? Why is she so secretive? Like I said, this was why... This whole avenue of story made me think that there was a traitor. But the fact there's no traitor and Laura Dern is literally being secretive for no fucking reason otherwise, other than to be dramatic is ridiculous. It is a complete plot thread of fucking stupidity. Why does she not tell anyone the plan when it is so fucking obvious? There's no reason for her being secretive at all. That's the first big problem with the movie. So we go back to with Ray and Luke, and what we find out is they have different versions of what happened with Ren. We find out that, well, from Ren's side, he feels that Luke was going to kill him because he was evil. Uh, he was turning to the dark side, and he didn't even, like, he was just going to cut him down. Kind of like Mace Windu, going to cut down uh, Palpatine and everything. But what we find out is actually Luke had a thought of doing it. He had a moment's hesitation, but then he decided not to. But the problem was Ren saw him standing above him with his lightsaber and acted in defense and turned to the dark side. So I like that. I like that Luke has so broken like he had the hubris of his legend. That's what he talks about. That's the whole point of this film's ide ideologies is the hubris of heroes and the hubris of villains too as we find out of what happens later on with Snook. So what later ha transpires is Luke doesn't care. He doesn't want to fight anymore and Rey basically leaves because that's exactly what Luke did in Empire Strikes Back. And then Luke gets um, talking with Yoda who burns this ancient Jedi tree that Luke has been kind of caring for for the last little while. And what we see is <laughs> Yoda, who's a ghost who could apparently whack people in the face. Um, he says, and it's also, it was a puppet. That was so awesome. That Yoda was a fucking puppet. Um, and what happens is Yoda just basically tells him that they weren't page turners. This wasn't, the force is the idea of being with, like, the force isn't a mentality. or. And what Yoda basically says is that the Jedi are not just a yeah they were flawed but you doing here sitting nothing doesn't add anything and ray clearly has a purpose and you do too and i like the conversation between yoda and luke that was awesome oh by the way there's a part that i've totally fucking missed out on uh finn and this girl rose who honestly yeah some people say you may should like her but she's fucking pointless in the story in my opinion they go off to this casino planet to get this hacker that can break into the shield so they can turn off the tracking device. And that story goes nowhere. Absolutely nowhere. It is an entire waste of time. At one point, so they go to the casino planet. They get captured. They find Beniki El Del Toro, who's in it. And again, a totally useless character. He's the hacker. And what they do is they break out. They go on this really cool, this really visually interesting looking chase with on these weird tauntaun, not tauntaun things. And it was at halfway point where they're running through the city. I'm like, 
I don't give a shit about any of this. This is just filler. There's no point to this part. There's nothing that's happening here. And I have a feeling the story thread's going to go nowhere. And that was the first point where I was like, uh oh. So after they get off this planet, they go to the ship, they get in, and then it turns out Benikio Totoro just betrayed them. Story goes nowhere. A second part of the film that was a big uh oh for me. First, we got Lord Dern's uselessness, and then we got this Benikio Del Toro's character of total lack of importance. If you want a comparison, remember in Pirates 3 where they were all about getting the Jamaican lady's powers and whatnot? They were went through that whole fucking thread of trying to make her be one with the sea or some shit. And then she gets what she wants and she jumps into the sea and fucks off. That whole part of the story was just pointless. That's exactly what happens with Benikil Del Toro's character. However, we then go back to the Resistance and we find out that they are leaving the ship. And so they're starting to leave in these little shuttles. But now, actually, I got to go back a little bit. Ray goes to the ship and she gets on. Like, this is the funny thing. Ray and Ren, uh, sorry, Ray and Finn get onto the Super Snook Super Destroyer at the exact same time. And we see Snook. As we've seen him a little bit in early in this movie, he's fucking powerful. He's able to whip whap bitches all over the place. He's able to control General Hux through a fucking hologram when he could be miles. Like, you don't even know how far away he is. He's clearly miles away, but or like light years away. But he's able. He's that powerful. And when Lu, when Ren brings Ray to her to Snook, he's like he's like bitch slapping her all over the place he is so freaking powerful and all the while i'm sitting there going i really want to know more about snook i really want to know what snooky and what his powers were where he came from how he came into the leadership how he became the supreme leader all this backstory all this shit and you don't know it because and admittedly, this was a really cool part. I talked about the hubris. This film focuses on the hubris of heroes and villains. And what happens is Ray puts Ren right in front of him. And he says, take your lightsaber and destroy your enemy. All the while, because he's saying, I can see into his mind. I can see his intentions. But the thing is, he's not seeing it as clearly as he thinks because he's so full of hubris. Because all the while, Ray's lightsaber that Snook took and put right beside him earlier... Ren turns it, Kylo Ren turns it, and he activates it and chops him in half. And admittedly, that part was dope. That was so cool. But then, again, I thought about it going, How? Or, what? Because I'm thinking about the third film now. What are we going to do for the third film? Because now, and then after uh, after Kylo Ren and Rey, uh, the, after... Snook's dead. They have this really dope fight with all of his uh, bodyguards. And there's one that's got this whip thing. That's that's really cool. There's two dual scythes. It was a really cool fight scene. It was a lot better, in my opinion, than Force Awakens. Um, there was a lot more kind of a brutal, very rogue, very brawl-like mentality to the fight. I thought it was very well done. However, we then see that Ren try Kylo Ren tries to make Ray go onto his side. It's like there's no light, no dark. Leave the past, let it die. But Ray can't. So they split a lightsaber in half or something, and then and then uh, Ray escapes. But back into the whole Finn thing. So he's been betrayed. He's about to be have his head cut off by Phasma, who appears in the last fucking ten minutes of the movie. Um, so what happens is. As all the transport ships that are leaving to the Rebel secret base are getting blown up, Laura Dern, after half of the casualties have been inflicted, thinks, huh, I could just turn this ship around and fly it at, at them. But what she does is actually super awesome. She jumps to light speed and splits the fleet. Literally. She disintegrates the entire First Order ship. She snaps Snook's ship in half. It is such an amazingly visual part because there's no audio, there's no explosions, there's no music. Everyone in the theater 
it was just bat was just awestruck. That's the part I say in the mo- in my review that I dropped my draw. My draw I dropped my draw. That is what happened. And I yelled out, Killing spree! And I should have said fucking Rex, son! But anyways, so after that happens, another part comes into my mind going, Why haven't they done this before? You know, like, obviously no one wants to sacrifice ships, no one wants to do a suicide run, but that's what the bomber run was. Like, I know the ideal of the movie is to not do suicide runs, but shit, you could have taken out, like, why don't you just make some makeshift shitty ships and then just light speed right into their ships? You know, you could you could have droids do it! You could have droids! No sacrifice needed! Just put a droid on it! So anyways, that's another part that breaks the movie for me, is just the idea that it was a really visually cool thing to do, but why has no one done it before? Anyways, so then they get to the salt planet, which I think is Hoth, um, and they set up a defense, and they're about to fight, and the First Order has all these weird kind of toy-looking ATSTs and the gun from one of Snook's ships, and they fire it at the door. All the while... They're making a charge at the the gun with this uh, these really pieces of shit uh, little hovercraft things, which my friend called, uh, like, he drives a Toyota. He's like, ah, it's a Toyota Brigade. So they charge at it, and a lot of them get killed, and Poe realizes, oh, there's no point in sacrificing oneself. You need to fight another day. Let the Resistance burn a light to draw out the first order or some shit anyways finn continues on and i thought he was actually gonna die admittedly this was a part that i was like whoa is my boy about to die and then rose comes in smashes his ship and saves him and then we find out that there's been a love story apparently been brewing between the two i thought it was super weak um so then luke somehow appears out of nowhere all of a sudden he appears out of nowhere and he says hi to leia and he says "Ah, you know can't save ren which some people are a little bit upset about that luke just outright admits that he cannot save kylo ren but my thing is one this would have literally just been a repeat of episode three and episode seven because ren is gone And Luke has to deal with that. It's kind of hilarious because he's dealing in an absolute. But just the idea that Luke has to atone for his mistakes. And he realizes what he's done. He realizes what he's done is wrong. And he needs to do something about it. So they have this. Luke walks out and gets blasted by all the fucking ATSTs. But he's got like not a scratch on him. It was like what? I mean like another EA joke that he bought all the microtransactions. So none of the damage is mitigated to him. Anyways, so then Ray and Luke kind of fight, but you notice that Luke never makes contact with him. And all the while, the Resistance fighters are escaping. They're making a way out. They're getting out of the... Uh, they're making their way out of the, the place. They're getting out of the secret base. And then it turns out that Luke was never there. He was actually just projecting himself from his island, which, again, that was actually really cool. I liked that idea. I thought that was a cool idea. And because the movie made it think that, whoa, maybe he actually died when he got blasted by the ATSDs. Like, he, he was actually dead the whole time. He, he knew he was going to die when he went out. So the movie kind of pulls a trick, a fast one on you, and you're like, oh, that's sweet. And then Luke sits up on the island he's exhausted from having done it he looks up at the sky he looks at the sun and we see a second sun emerge and then the motherfucker fades he literally force gasm to death apparently and i was so fucking mad because literally the movie's like ah, i think you got you ah, i think you got, ah, got you bitch and that's what happens is luke is dead now and I don't know, I would have rather preferred him having been blasted to death. Because while it shows how Luke is is so powerful, that for some reason he feels that the story's done. But he's like jumping out halfway through. We now, and now going into the ninth movie, we have no one from the original movie series besides Chewie. That's it! Chewie's the only one now! Because... Han's dead, Luke's dead, and Carrie Fisher's gonna have to be killed off or something because she's unfortunately and very tragically passed away. So 
the film ends with Ren, Kylo Ren in charge of the resist of the First Order. The Resistance on the run again. They find out that their allies are nowhere to be seen, by the way. And we now have this weird connection. We have this connection between Rey and Ren that was all the while that was all done by Snook, which was a cool idea. Again, so much power, so much hubris, and and it was cool to have him die the way he did, but now there's so much that I want explained. I want to know so much more about who he was. So, but admittedly, some people can say, well, you didn't know what the Emperor really was. You kind of saw his face in the second in Empire Strikes Back, and then we saw him for a bit in Return of the Jedi, so I, and we only know of his history through the prequels. So, yes, I understand that there are some people who are going to find my views a little bit hostile. There are some really awesome moments in this movie. There's some really dope moments, but there's so many inconsistencies. Laura Dern's, for no reason, need for secrecy. The tracking thing. The entire casino story, the whole going to that planet was stupid. Oh yeah, there is this little part. If any of you didn't see it, one of the kids who they interacted with on the casino planet, they he's goes outside and he force pulls this broom to him. I didn't really see it, but I had I confirmed it with someone. So it kind of shows the film's idea is that the Jedi aren't dead. The last Jedi, because Jedi is plural as well. Jedi is a singular and a plural word. And for at least from what I've seen, because like the last of the like the end of the Jedi, right? The Jedi is a t not just a person, but it's also the religion, which I actually I like. I like that Luke called it a religion. It really harkened back to uh, to the old movies. However, they said at one point, "Godspeed." That's the first time I've ever heard that. Where did that come from? We've never known of anything of gods or anything. Well, there's in the extended. The, the the legends anyway anyways so like i said i liked a lot of aspects i liked kylo ren and ray's uh their their whole connection oh by the way we find out her parents were just junkers they just sold her and they left that whole mystery of who she was is kind of really a big letdown now i thought that that was going to be i don't know i was kind of hoping they weren't going to go with like luke was her father because i was like holy shit there's like too many re resemblances and obviously that was something that they wanted to avoid but i don't know it was it was kind of like oh oh that that's it it's kind of like when people put so many fan theories into something and then it turns out to be completely nothing anyways I enjoy parts of The Last Jedi, but there's so many parts that I don't care for. There's a lot of parts that slow the fuck down. There's a lot of really, whoa, moments. But then when you think about it, it kind of breaks the movie for you. But anyways, guys, that is my spoiler-filled review of The Last Jedi. I hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, I'm sorry that I have this very harsh opinion of the movie, but honestly, that's just how I feel about it, guys. I... I don't know if I'll see it again in theaters. I don't feel like it. It's the first one. I don't know. I wanted. I saw Force Awakens right after. I saw Rogue One right after. I don't really have a desire to see The Last Jedi again. Even though there was great visual effects. There was great battles. There was great music. John Williams did some good music. But it's just... I don't know. There's just so much... Eh. There's a lot of fucking piss breaks in this movie. A lot of fucking piss breaks. Jeremy Johns even said it best. The, the Casino Planet is a piss break in itself. Anyways, guys, thank you for watching this video. If you like this review, leave a like down below. If you like my content, maybe subscribe. Anyways, that's all from me. I hope you enjoyed this video. I'll see you guys next time.